are immensely privileged to welcome Professor Dr. Shashikala Gurpur to our gathering today, where she graces us as the distinguished Jean Munet Chair Professor for the years 2021 to 2024. A remarkable position co-founded by the European Union under the EOC LAMP initiative. Professor Gurupur is a Fulbright scholar and wears multiple hats, serving as the esteemed director of Symbiosis Law School, Pune, and as a dean of the Faculty of Law at Symbiosis International Dean University, Pune, where she plays an instrumental role in shaping the future of legal education. Man has earned global influence as an academician and a narrator, having presented more than 325 invited lectures, workshops, and seminars across a spectrum of countries, including India, Thailand, the United States, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Germany, Australia, Canada, and the United Arab Emirates. Dr. Gurpur's journey is characterized by excellence from its very foundation. She embarked on her educational path in a Kannada medium school in Gurpur and holds degree in both science and law from the Mangalore University. She received her PhD in international law from Mysore University, emerging as the topper of her class. During her LLM, she was not only the postgraduate topper, but also the recipient of three prestigious gold medals from Mysore University. She has been with Symbiosis Law School since 2007, emphasizing her dedication to legal education and is a pioneer in EU legal studies in India, marking her as an academic trailblazer. Dr. Gurpur has served as the co-director of the gender and human rights-based wings of non-governmental organizations for two years, contributing to the upliftment of the marginalized communities and the promotion of gender equality. Additionally, she has applied her skills to the corporate world, having worked as an HR manager and admin administration pro professional at a prominent multinational corporation in Abu Dhabi, UAE from 2004 to 2007. Ma'am was named in the list of top 100 legal luminaries of India by LexisNexis in 2016 and has been awarded the Kitturu Rani Chanama Award by the government of Karnataka in 2019. It is my most humble privilege to invite you to this podium to pre present the inaugural of this man. Respected uh, Vice Chancellor of the Sinamari University, uh, Dr. Adarinda, uh, our respected uh, Dean, uh, colleague, former Vice Chancellor of Karnataka State Law University, Dr. Pramanetra, our own professor of eminence, a kind of friend, philosopher, and guide, Dr. Vibhute sir, the leadership of uh, CMR Law School, uh, the students, professors, and all those who have gathered here, and my own uh, fellow guest here, uh, and co-sponsor of this event with the CMR, uh, Professor Gaurav. Uh, a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. Uh, my address, I thought, is a specialist address, but if it is also going as inaugural address, there is no pleasure better than that. Uh, for many reasons, what I prepared and brought here assumes importance. First of all, my dearest friend, Purvi Pokriyal, is uh, the founder dean of the NFSU Law School, uh, where I had the privilege of delivering the induction address to the first batch of, first ever batch of law students specializing in data science, forensic science, alongside law. This happened a uh, year ago. And in the meanwhile, Purvi, Dr. Purvi has grown meteorically as the dean and latest is that she has become the campus chief of Delhi campus, which is equivalent position to a vice chancellor. So on behalf of her, Professor Gaurav is here. I think it's a great privilege to have him also with us as we inaugurate this uh, uh, very meaningful event. For many reasons, this uh, initiative on the part of CMR resumes a national significance. Uh, we are at the turn of two important debates at the national level. One is the national uh, digital uh, forensics initiative, namely the DNA uh, data bank, which has been shelved now, rather withdrawn, because of the huge dissidence that was expressed by various lobby of human rights uh, activists 
uh, intellectuals, transdisciplinary concerns, apart from the global concerns, on maintaining a DNA profile of those who have been accused or those who have been under the radar uh, in, at the expense and in violation of their privacy, in uh, violation of their possibility of reform and change. So this is a fresh air of democracy that we are breathing where the parliament along with the initiative of the government had to withdraw this bill. The second uh, very, I mean, this bill has been in the making for almost four years and uh, I have had the, in the meanwhile, I have had the opportunity of voicing great concerns and my opposition in one of the training initiatives of Gujarat National Law University in the month of June when we were training doctors on law and genetics because genetics is my favorite uh, area in relation to law. Uh, the other concern uh, or the other development that we are witnessing at the turn of this quarter of this year is the renaming and reform proposal of the three key criminal law uh, uh, instruments, namely the Indian Evidence Act, the Criminal Procedure Code and Indian uh, uh, Penal Code. Uh, all the three have been framed at a certain point in time in history where the colonial administration uh, used law to consolidate its stranglehold on the Indian population. I don't know how many of you have read. There is a latest report by an economics scholar, uh, a couple of scholars, who have written about how many Indians were killed during the colonial administration in India. Some of you must read what Edward Said has captured in Culture and Imperialism, where he speaks about how 35,000 soldiers could rule such a big country, which had great history, oldest civilization. It couldn't be possible unless the fabric of peace, namely law and justice, and the fabric of meaningfulness and self-discovery, namely the culture, were consistently destroyed. So it's very sad to say as people who are aspiring to be the experts in law and some of us who have, I don't claim myself as an expert, but who have worked for decades in the area of law, that law can be used as what Karl Marx once exclaimed, engine of oppression. So we are celebrating almost a centenary, nearly a centenary of our democracy in the light of these laws. And we have constantly, through the experiment of our courts, NGO initiatives, people's movement put this law under radar in the under the principles of constitutionalism especially under fundamental rights time and again judges have said how the approach to this law procedurally in the area of evidence and in the area of interpretation of the indian penal code need to be viewed in the circumstance of new social change agents one of such social change agent is society itself uh, changes from within. For example, the whole uh, hue and cry about triple color. Uh, orthodox, uh, anti-woman, uh, anti-liberation kind of language in the Indian Penal Code, which had to be reviewed as if a female body is a passive recipient of the agency of power, whether it is in the form of state or culture or religion. So, in the light of such confrontation between constitutionality Internal agents, agents of change uh, like education, awareness, voices to the marginalized communities and newfound identity of India, these laws needed change long ago. I always hated this word Indian Penal Code. I mean, what purpose did it serve? Uh, who made this code? At what time? If we are a common law system, why the code? So these questions always lingered in my mind as a law student and later on as a law teacher. But today we have come of age and such an initiative was taken by the government. Uh, uh, Home Minister wrote individually to the law deans in the country. First a general advertisement came and then the announcement came. Then Delhi National Law School claimed that it was the leader of this reform. But nothing could stop our central government from seeking uh, views from the grassroots. So, Symbiosis Law School, Pune, where we took this seriously, because first time we ignored this, thinking that we will send our views to the Delhi National Law School, which had come out with a set of questions, 
allegedly or reportedly framed by some Harvard University scholar, where I thought questions were too much into the polemic of the existing penal code. If you're talking about interpretation of existing penal code within existing law, where is the scope for bringing our realities in terms of this? So we embarked on an empirical journey. So did the Mumbai University. So in the inaugural, I would like to share with you these divergent perspectives. We had six key areas which we had taken up where we thought that in the light of new technology, especially India going digital, and Indian talent driving the world into the new age of digital tomorrow, we thought that it is opportune for us to view uh, how forensics or science is interacting with law in terms of criminal justice administration. And we thought that all the gains of science should come to justice and should come to people, should come to resolve some of the long-standing issues, especially the backlog in the courts, long-drawn procedures which are uh, affecting the constitutionally sacred values of freedom, liberty, uh, you know, people waiting for uh, bail or people waiting for their appeal to be decided in high court. I was told by one of the Madhya Pradesh high court judges, sitting judges, when I was initi initially in my position as a director, he was a parent, he told me that one of the bail petition appeal was waiting for 17 years. So uh, how technology could really help and ease and lubricate the wheels of justice, especially when you look at criminal justice administration system only from the contemptuous point of crime without looking into the constitutional cardinal values of human freedom, liberty, opportunity to reform, you know, because we are running our administration on our own. It's a democratic system where every citizen has a right to participate, right to express. So we thought that we should embark on this journey. So braving the COVID-19 difficulty of having to meet the respondents, we still created a questionnaire and we looked at some of those field realities. So I would uh, take your permission or rather I would invite your attention to treat this presentation as a presentation uh, on the divergent perspective that we need to bear in mind when we approach criminal justice reforms. So these divergent perspectives come from the point of view of human rights, which are also articulated and enshrined as constitutional guarantees in part three as fundamental rights. Secondly, the position of the vulnerable. Thirdly, the ethics that we need to follow when we are incorporating technology to address some of the nagging issues of criminal justice administration system. The cyber forensics, which has a close bearing with the, most of the issues that we are facing today when we are using technology. Because those who developed, marketed, and universalized these technologies did not think of the way in which the deviant tendencies to earn money and to unjustly gain at the expense of those who are new to technology, who wouldn't have thought evil uh, to be manifesting through technology, that need to be incorporated into the technological governance. That is governed in the cyber forensics. And then the uh, Narcotic and uh, uh, Psychotropic Substances Act, which is Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Related Offenses, where Home Minister himself said that the approach should be more of a therapeutic approach rather than the incarceration or a kind of uh, what we call as a retributive approach. You know, the students of criminal law will uh, make sense in terms of the four theories of punishment. So he clearly said that the approach here needs to be far from uh, the the retributive or uh, we have uh, the approach of punitive approach, the punishment approach. And you know the extreme in Singapore where they hang the person to death uh, if they are found with the possession of that and possession of how much, etc., being controversially challenged in global media and because of that Singapore has drawn flak. So any government which does not treat its wrongdoers in a humane fashion and does not protect the cardinal values of human rights which are global values and more so in the globalizing reality today will be condemned to even being deviant. So you are punishing the deviant, you are becoming deviant in that because the principle of proportionality is also a very important. Uh, principle to be followed. So the background that we took 
Sorry, I'm using the National Crime Record Bureau's 2019 statistics. In uh, two years, the statistics has changed, but some of the fundamental trends have remained constant, which speak of long-standing issues in our society reflecting in the form of these uh, activities. So in 2019, first we began with where is NCRB documenting highest uh, recorded crimes? And we discovered that offenses against human body, very interesting. Uh, offenses against human body is the area where highest crimes have been, uh, highest percentage of crimes have been noted, which is 27%. Next comes liquor and narcotic drug related acts. What kind of a society we are in is the question that is asked at the end of it. And then miscellaneous crimes, offenses against property, again, pretty big uh, offense uh, category, 22%. And here, in terms of property, when we go to intellectual property, it's 4%. Because there, the criminal law uh, intervention happens rarely. Before that intervention could happen, out of court settlement or mutual uh, settlement happens, because it is a question of uh, reaching that idea to the public and gaining financial advantage. So there is a quick, smarter resolution that is made. Therefore, you can easily understand that such offenses are less in number. Now, we looked at the vulnerable, as I told you, the first category, where we looked at women. And the 2019 statistic shows state-wise uh, uh, proportions, as well as the crimes which women undergo, very interestingly, are happening within the much trivialized, ignored area of family relationships. So just see here, cruel, cruelty by husband and his relatives has the highest percentage, which we show in blue, 31%. And then we have uh, rape offenses, which is about 8%. Other offenses about, uh, let us say, in the green zone, 14%, uh, the green part of the pie. So that is one. Secondly, highest amount of crime committed against women is reported from Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, then comes, I mean, first comes Uttar Pradesh, and then comes uh, uh, Rajasthan, then comes Madhya Pradesh, then comes Assam. So what do you see here? Even in case of cruelty by husband or his relatives, Madhya Pradesh is the highest, and then comes Uttar Pradesh, then comes Maharashtra, then comes Tamil Nadu. Qualitatively speaking, looking at the population and size of the state, also, you have to draw certain inferences. You can't just go by total figures. The volume of people in Uttar Pradesh, volume of people in Madhya Pradesh, compared to the volume of people in Rajasthan, uh, it's quite interesting that in Rajasthan, the rape-related offenses are reported highest. And no wonder in India, these states are called Bihar states. Uh, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, uh, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh. And Hindi word Bihar stands for six states which means underdeveloped states. So, so some kind of social fabric there needs intervention. Therefore, it is not just law alone. Probably technology and other forces of social change could be used is the inference that we can draw. Coming to the second category of the vulnerable, in, in case of top crimes against scheduled caste and scheduled caste, the disadvantaged sections of the society, look at the crimes listed under Indian Penal Code, simple hurt, rape, Assault on women with the intent to outrage the modesty, criminal intimidation, rioting, and other crimes, such as those which come under civil rights, etc. If you see, even simple hurt and other crimes occupy huge proportion. Is it that is it is really those kind of crimes or the bigger crimes have been reduced to that level because the vulnerable groups may not have big advocacy and support systems. However, the percentage of rape in that case is also something which is alarming and assault on women. So compounding the vulnerability, one is as a marginalized section and within that section how women have been uh, targets of uh, uh, bigger percentage of offenses. Now, state-wise ranking, if you see, once again you see here the green pie. The green pie is 44% which is uh, other crimes and uh, rioting is uh, 30%. And in that also you will see certain states have very high record. In almost all crimes in terms of SCST, Uttar Pradesh occupies the highest. And then in some case Rajasthan, some case Bihar. Then Maharashtra, Karnataka and Gujarat, they are at the lower uh, level. But the crimes are there. Attaining zero level is the ideal level. So this is one. And then in ST cases also, looking at the population of ST, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, 
uh, again occupy higher level and Odisha also. You all know the reported cases also come from these territories in India. This is a very interesting distribution at the national level that we see. Uh, so I would like to, uh, I will be leaving the PowerPoint presentation for your benefit. You could go through the framework and you could understand. I request the dean and the director to circulate it to all. Now, objective of the ministry was looking at safety and security of individual community and nation. This is very interesting because criminal law is to be strong to look at a prosperous society. A society cannot prosper if the security is under danger. That's why Article 21, even though it looks secure in life and liberty, uh, the implicit in Article 21 is right to security, which is now the duty of the state. But if you want to give it into the hands of artificial intelligence or technology, maybe it could become more uh, efficient. One of the reasons why we have not been coping with the uh, needs of security in our society is our police, our judges, our lawyers, our systems are not moving past with the technology. So this is one message that strongly comes in, even in various researches. I have gone through a number of researchers in the Indian context who say that Technically, capability building uh, in the police and uh, specialized people supporting the police and supporting judges. One of the recommendations is that there should be separate ministry or uh, specialized think tank called justice statistics and justice assistance. Those who are trained in technology, data science, big data, AI, assisting the judges and also forensic science experts and others assisting the judges. Then only we can have the approach of criminal law and criminal justice administration and criminal justice governance being very, very strong and securing the citizen safety. Second is community being aware of these possibilities on their own also. Say, we have community watch approach. In advanced countries, this approach is there. Surveillance is done by the communities. That can also help. And then the nation as such. Nation's security is under threat when there are arrests, when there are uh, sleeping sleeper cells of these various internationally disruptive terrorist groups. So here also technology plays a very key role and citizen awareness plays a key role. Second important, dignity, justice and worth of the individual enshrined under the constitution, ministry has pronounced it. Third is making system more citizen centric where particularly the vulnerable sections such as women and children and as I told you marginalized sections are taken care. And then speedy and affordable justice. I gave you the example already how technology can ease it, the long standing backlogs at the expense of individual opportunity for reform and freedom need to be handled. And uh, we uh, at SLS Pune, we looked at a few points as I told you already in that only few points I highlight to you. One is improving the conviction rate. How do we improve the conviction rate? Because many states have registered not more than 28%. Maharashtra had lowest record of 17%. Gujarat much before had about 13%. Now it has improved up to about 30%. There is a lot of improvement seen, but this need to be improved between police officials and public prosecutors. One of the reasons could be that every offense is recorded and pre, uh, we, we call it as uh, the pre-investigation, uh, investigation is a must from the beginning. That investigation to be efficient, how do we use the knowledge of forensics and how do we deploy technology and capability building to train the officers. And another is once it enters the court of law, uh, whether it can be compounded, whether plea bargaining could be there. How do you look at plea bargaining's human dimension in terms of those offenders be, or accused being put under surveillance or probation? So these, there is so much scope for improvement and uh, better governance in criminal justice administration. So we had one book edited, another law school which took up this initiative by Dr. O.K. and his team in um, Mumbai, Maharashtra National Law University, Mumbai where they looked at digital autopsy or non-invasive autopsy, one of the important uh, interventions that forensics can make. Second is preventing wrongful con con conviction. Third is looking at uh, refusal of bail to be broadly looked at. Bail, not jail, is the philosophy that is being ingrained by our current Chief Justice of India as well. Uh, then law commission report to be implemented on reforms, focusing more on juvenile justice, very, very important, children in conflict with law. 
Modesty of women, behavior of the policing. The police behavior is the biggest challenge. My own work in Karnataka also revealed that. And that resulting in over-criminalization of the society. So these are the issues this book is dealing with. I invite your attention. You can procure this book. And our approach is a little different from that because we looked at diverse stakeholders. We gathered data from the field. And uh, braving the COVID-19, we could get only 107 respondents from across lawyers, prosecutors, former judges, among others. And we had a uh, round table. And from there, what we gathered and refined, I'm going to present before you. One is, how do we improve the conviction rate? One of the strong points that came was in connection with section 24, 25, 25A, where you appoint proper prosecutors with minimum seven years experience. You know, if you look at appointment of prosecutors, between Karnataka, Maharashtra, Gujarat, criteria vary. There is no dedicated institution, if you see uh, in some of the states, uh, the, the political interference, lack of quality prosecution, low conviction rate, no competitive exam in selection of prosecutors. Karnataka had for very long, Andhra Pradesh has, but we don't see that in Maharashtra. So there is a need to change the criteria for appointment and standardize them, need to consider the recommendation of judges, means put them also in the committee, need to have independent body to review the performance of the prosecutors. Uh, then we have the Police Act where we need to have more and more talented people being attracted and independence to prosecutors and investigation. That's why what we recommended was, which was also there in earlier recommendations which we gathered, two parts of the police, the law and order part of the police and investigative wing of the police. The investigative wing needs to have multi-talented kind of orientation. They cannot be similar type of uh, competencies which can be used here. We have Prakash Singh case and other cases which show that multitasking by the police who are busy in VAP duties and other duties which result in interference with the efficiency of the criminal justice administration. Our data also shows that there is a need to create two wings and then in the audience when we did that uh, uh, round table we had a, a hybrid mode, almost online mode, we had about 900 respondents, they also agreed that it should be like that and cooperation between police and the prosecutor. So this was the online poll we conducted. Then we also saw the uh, lack of devotion resulting in improper investigation. Um, so why the delay is happening? The fixing of the responsibility should happen. Advantage should not be given to the accused. This is a major argument that came up. And they said that there is a need to increase the accountability and quality of investigation and prosecution. Uh, so there can be some administrative, uh, you can call uh, restrictions such as uh, uh, dem uh, demotions or dismissal in case of such grave lapses on the part of these officers and there is a need to have an audit so that you could fix the accountability. And uh, investigating team should have forensic expert, it should have medical doctors among others because many a times when the policing uh, is accused, one of the accusations is that they are not sensitive to children for example. When a child is a victim or a survivor and a so, and when the child goes there, the police act as if they are a, another complainant and the parents are not treated with that sensitivity. So we need to have social workers intervening here among other psychiatrists coming in here because it's a child who could be, whose, whose harm has been done, that harm's impact could be uh, remedied or uh, uh, thera uh, therapeutically approached if we have expert psychiatrists there. So, to support such investigative approaches, we need to have more forensic labs, we need to have more forensic experts and computer experts to assist the police. So, a kind of professional policing, Raksha Shakti University is the concept of this professionalization of the police. I had the privilege of giving this uh, recommendation at some point with our chancellor to the Home Minister on how to professionalize our police. You just go to the website of uh, Norwegian approach, Korean approach how they have professionalized their police as a special power from the constabulary itself. In India, we have so many films joking about the police, but the reality is that these people have not been professionally oriented. It doesn't attract good talent. The minute we make that work more a professional work, I'm sure that better talent will be attracted. And uh, uh, we also see in case of women, the burden of proof is of highest order, although in certain cases, the burden of proof, the evidentiary value, have been specially laid down. Like for example, 
presumption in case of custodial rape or presumption about the character of the prosecutrix to be removed from section 54. So these reforms have been there, but still treating these cases of the powerless at par with general crimes need to be reviewed. This is what uh, came out very strongly. And time-bound trial, training to the investigators, establishing sufficient number of trial courts. For example, district court is supposed to be the court for human rights. It's supposed to be the court for business, for corporate matters, and then also the appeals and direct uh, uh, prosecutor approaches. So uh, how seriously and how fast are you able to handle these issues which are threats to peace and, so peace and security fabric of the society and justice? Therefore, there is a need to improve the court infrastructure as well. And then uh, there is also need for expanding uh, evidence act to the public servants uh, who are arresting and detaining in custody. We have seriousness in custodial death. We have seriousness in custodial torture. But how much of it? Person has to die to take it seriously. That also not all cases are taken seriously. Very few cases where due to intervention of human rights activists and others, it comes to the limelight. So this is another challenge that we have. Therefore, expanding this provision to regulate the state power and the police power um, and to put it on a kind of just and fair uh, pedestal is very important. Now the digital and paperless system to be brought. I was told that sub-inspector has to give out of his salary the money to buy papers and even now handwritten and the writers are very difficult to tackle. Although they are trained in how to convert your version as a complainant into the FIR, they themselves are uh, a, a kind of manpower to be handled. So we need to have customized uh, what we call as uh, formats, templates and digital paperless uh, approach and interconnection of different departments. Service through email and uh, WhatsApp should be valid. Why should you go for a police constable going and serving the summons at the door in this day and age when Uber and Ola are possible and uh, Zomato and uh, Swiggy is possible. So digital interconnection of uh, departments, recording of the court proceedings. Fortunately now, Supreme Court is also uh, visible to all of us and we all viewed the same-sex marriage judgment across the country. So this kind of more and more engagement of the civic participation which this government intends. Then the other point is narco analysis, uh, where uh, 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 scientific method like lie detector test and brain mapping and all these um, are taken into consideration, but there are many ethical challenges which come about the privacy, about the threat to person's health after this test has been done the forcible administration of narco-analysis or lie detection, chances of abuse with the political underpinnings. And India is not yet prepared. This is what the research shows. Maybe that's why some of these reformist, technologically advanced legislations are should be going in a slow pace because of that. Uh, so do you agree with the paperless system in India? Almost all agree. But should the courts rely on a, uh, scientific tests such as narco analysis or forensics exclusively recently in Kerala a judgment was given where exclusively relying on forensic uh, evidence they convicted. This is questionable in a country like India where people themselves under the fear of police might submit to this test and uh, the tests may be indicating it but then it in a way it stigmatizes as well. Names are not withheld, they are announced in the society. Therefore, our idea of inclusive democracy ancient Indian system, prisons were rare. I mean, uh, we, we never read about prisons in Kalidasa's Kavya uh, or anywhere. Uh, it came with the Mughal system. Again, coming from Mediterranean and all these areas. It, what Foucault calls as a society has to be humane in its approach to punishment in terms of the proportion of pain, not because that person will change by infliction of pain, but because in the advanced state, society feels disgusted about uh, such standards. So that's how gladiator shows were removed in the Roman system. Because as society became more and more advanced and sensitive and empathetic, it, it felt a sense of disgust. So the hallmark of a society is, a society's evolution is how less pain it inflicts on its uh, uh, wrongdoers. Because if you view wrongdoer as an enemy who is one of the members of the society, who is not born a wrongdoer, who may have inability to process the right kind of behavior signals, and uh, should we treat it as a case of uh, 
uh, illness or disability, or should we take it, take it as a case of condemnable evil? So this is something that we need to have in the back of our mind. Therefore, exclusive reliance on forensics themselves for conviction is something that is strict. No, although some high court judges have come in that line. Hello, ma'am. Good morning. Especially when we view. Uh, morning. Am I audible? Uh, how many of you watch Innocence Files? Am I audible? I know those who are in the auditorium are net Netflix generation. Anybody who has watched Innocence Files, I invite your attention to watch it. Innocence Files, uh, there is a little YouTube trailer uh, on Innocence Files. It's a kind of uh, documentary which is made on the basis of Innocence Project, which was driven by a Harvard professor investigating into the death row cases in the Missouri prison. You know, Missouri is a place from where this uh, novel came uh, to, kill a, uh, to kill a mockingbird. And there is a mockingbird museum as well in that place, I mean, which, is the, which is the center of the black struggle. So in this place, a lot of blacks were condemned to prisons, uh, being accused of uh, murders in the local rapes and murders. And uh, in one episode which I watched, I saw that exclusive clinching evidence came from a periodontic forensic operations that a particular type of teeth were the ones which were pecking the knee of this girl whose body was found in the local lake, only to realize that these teeth constantly in all cases figured out and they were attributed to the black witch's teeth and in the death row such people only were there. Only the later reopening of these cases under the Innocence Project uh, revealed that it was a particular type of man-eater fishes which were there, which were, uh, you can call them as uh, carnivorous fishes which were there in that pond, who had a typical type of suckers in their mouth. So, one clinching evidence leading to the death row was challenged in that. There are many other cases which are opened. I invite your attention to Innocence Files. Which, were, which was able to bring the prisoner from the death row in the fag end of 48 hours remaining to an electrocution. So such miracles can happen if you are looking at all other possibilities. Till the end, in the Innocence Files interview, the periodontic expert of the bygone days maintains that he was right. But then the court which totally relied on and the subsequent prosecution which reopened the case was looking at all other possible arguments and there was what we call as let the thousand guilty escape, but not one innocent be punished. So the cardinal principle of common law was followed. Now, the other thing we looked at was advancing victim protection, where we argued that victim should be, victim uh, involvement and victim, victim protection and victim integration, victim rehabilitation should be introduced uh, to look at the socio-economic, psychological, and sociological aspects of those who are victims of crime. There is also secondary victimization. Primarily a person is victim, but his wife and children, or her husband and family. So these are the points where victim impact statement should be introduced in India as part of uh, the whole process is what we argued for. And uh, uh, right now the effectiveness is not very much there. So. Uh, it needs to be introduced and district legal aid services authority could get into this. Uh, and we also said that in case of cyber offenses and uh, particularly the offenses against women and children, after we gave this uh, proposal, we had uh, uh, National Women's Commission coming out in the open and saying that 30% increase in domestic violence was reported during COVID-19. So we said that one-stop center for all kinds of offenses should be there where a conjoined participation under the executive and judiciary could be visualized and there needs to be a training to be provided on vocational skills and welfare schemes and then also the structured functioning to be administered by the executive as well as judicial officers and to avoid political appointments in these offices because most of the time commissions have political appointments. So. Uh, this one point uh, stop or one stop center which has got a combination of skills uh, and techn technical uh, equipment should be extended for all victims and special attention should be paid to minors and women who face violence. And then a uh, uh, lot of other aspects of victim participation and victim support was also taken into consideration uh, and quantum of compensation to be uh, based on victim statement 
which should be integrated into the criminal justice administration was what we said. Then the point was also on offenses against women, 498A, which I said in the beginning how NCRB said that that's the maximum category of offense. Today, we, we have it literally made little lapse because of the abuse of the process by the police and others in booking even the child in the cradle. So that uh, should not dilute the uh, nature of the law because there are many who disuse the law because they don't have the access, they don't have the capacity or support from their parental family, etc. And the last one we looked at here was the marital rape. I mean, time and again, high courts have pointed out all over the world, more than 70 countries have uh, legally recognized this offense. Probably here that a lot of technological and forensic aspect could be, although law cannot look into one's privacy of the bedroom, uh, the the idea of uh, uh, you know light man the serial used to be there where they looked at light detection not by uh, narco analysis but by not by chemical injection and things like that it is by means of physical science and I have seen in National Forensic University people specialized in this so by use of sensors and advanced technology this kind of offense could be detected and nobody need to be put up with the offense just because it is sanctified by marriage. The other is rape being gender neutral, not just uh, 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 being in heterosexual context and uh, marital rape as a separate category of offense. So uh, in uh, another very interesting uh, divergent perspective, I would quickly invite your attention to application of genetics or DNA for resolving the criminal cases. It is here that the genetics or the DNA uh, detection or DNA a test could be applied to human material as well as a non-human material at the site of the crime scene to look at what are the kinds of people who are involved, so variations, etc. They could resolve the conflict, especially you know, uh, in uh, today we are talking about a sudden uh, automated what we call as art, uh, automated weapon systems, which are coming into place. These are now not restricted to between nation or nation and belligerent groups, but they can also be coming in internal strifes, in group attacks, etc. At that time, if a group of people are devastated, then how do you detect those people who are de devastated? It is the DNA which helps in uh, variations being identified. And uh, using the DNA and using the DNA evidence as the clinching evidence in the cases is a little bit of difficulty. So this it is here that law enforcement has to be uh, viewing the DNA based uh, intervention and uh, forcing the DNA test or keeping the secrecy of the DNA test so that it doesn't impact other areas of life or other relationships also. For example, look at something like paternity test or uh, look at some paternity test in case of child in the womb. Now what will happen? What could be the consequences? The, both the child as well as the mother can face some kind of a danger to life if the secrecy is not maintained and many times reports have been leaked out also. So it is here that uh, we have to be extremely careful and in case of uh, DNA testing, we can also use it in case of human trafficking when the people go missing. Uh, victim identification and the mass disaster or now with warlike situation, military intelligence, so it is here that uh, we have to be careful. Selvi case in our state has clearly said that uh, narco analysis is violative, means using scientific techniques is violative. Uh, but then uh, using the DNA in criminal uh, investigation, I was studying uh, an article by Patel and others where it showed that there are certain high courts which are using DNA evidence. Not many high courts have effectively used. It's less than 20% even considered, not as the sole basis, but even consideration hasn't been there. That means our judges also need a lot of orientation to this and there is any, even in case of non-human forensic genetics, what is non-human way? Food can be the basis, then animals can be the basis, plants can be the basis. In crime scene, there could be many other things. For example, Napoleon was killed long ago. People thought that because he was in that isolated uh, place, he died of uh, depression. It was only later that when his hair was uh, put to examination, they came to know he died of what? Arsenic poisoning. Because arsenic finally deposits itself in the exoskeletal structures like hair. So many a times, 
these kinds of materials, uh, when they are collected, they could point out in the direction of uh, not only environmental conservation, but also in terms of crimes against environment. I mean, now you know that the tiger claw has made a big news in Karnataka. But uh, many times, how the, uh, the possession of such material may lead to new evidences as well. Therefore, DNA and uh, biological evidence is something that is sensitive, very private, but has to be administered with a lot of caution to principles of informed consent, privacy, autonomy, anonymity. But at the same time, it could give a clinching clue about resolving a case. Now, in case of cyber and forensic offenses, our deliberation revealed that there has to be a separate chapter in the Indian Evidence Act on digital evidences. And uh, forensic and computer experts should be part of the team, not only in cyber cases, but in general cases also, because cyber evidences, now the call directory is assisting a lot in resolving criminal cases and quick resolution also. But can that be the sole basis is the question. Need to increase the number of forensic labs also, because many a times outcome is uh, related to that. Now, in case of uh, offenses punishable by death also, standardization is uh, required in approach. We call it a sentencing guidelines, which don't exist. So uh, we have researchers in that line. Now, in case of age detection, the mental health issue to be taken into consideration is another one. While determining liability, it's not the physical age, but the mental age. Uh, how do you determine mental age? Again, the expertise from the forensic university and forensics becomes useful. Uh, now, on the uh, drugs and narcotic substances, we have section-wise uh, analysis. But what we saw is that more and more evidence-based harm reduction approach should be coupled uh, with counseling as alternative to incarceration. And the accused mental health also should be taken into consideration. The, the rigorous enforcement of NDPS shows that one who is in possession, who is in custody, seems to be the target of all our societal anger, rather than the larger racket and network. I and mean, that could be busted with global uh, understandings under the United Nations, the collaborations, and uh, global cyber networks. And within India, also, these rackets could be busted. Uh, therefore, consumption drugs and commercial usage need to be distinguished and the necessity, again, psycho, social, criminal, mental health profiling of the accused to need to be taken into consideration. Approach should be more rehabilitative and these approaches have been effective in the European Union in abating this addiction as well as uh, trafficking and uh, uh, possession for consumption rather than for 20 grams hanging someone to death kind of approach in Singapore, which is extreme. Now, in a democratic country, we could not go like that. We have a long history of democracy. So the new argument which is coming, even back to people like Baba Ramdev, because marijuana seems to have a lot of solution to some of the mental health issues. So legalizing for medicinal purpose, at least for some purposes, should be there, as because it is considered traditionally as a recreational drug. So something which is used like bhang and alcohol, added, should it be added to the schedule? Even someone gets drunk, you consider it as very normal. But if somebody has one gram of uh, marijuana, you consider it as demonization. So this demonization approach needs to be reviewed when we administer the law. And that is clearly brought out by the government also in its approach in terms of reformative, uh, rehabilitative, rather than incarceration approach and uh, different treatments to be provided to natural drugs and artificial synthesis, like methadone, artificial synthesized, lab synthesized drug. So in conclusion, from the inaugural address, I would say that every student and every faculty should add an element of bringing interdisciplinary perspective of science and law uh, in a forensic way. Second, there should be a very strong research culture. It should not simply pass off what comes in the newspaper or what comes in uh, this one, go deep into the juridical research on that. Uh, and uh, whether the reliance on forensic evidence alone should be fair and should be supported. If you want to say that it should not be, then what are the possible alternatives? Again, make research on that particular issue and then give the conclusion. Now, post-conviction, DNA revisit is very important. Forensic revisit is very important, as you saw in Innocent Spies. And justice statistics and justice assistance department to be encouraged with the forensic and cyber experts. 
is one suggestion and awareness and capacity building of police, judges, lawyers and general public as well so that they could approach them with their rights which are in danger because of extreme reliance on such scientific evidence or reliance on scientific evidence destroying their constitutional guarantees. So we all trade a balance because we are holding balance and we have a blindfolded goddess of justice there. Therefore, this sensitivity, I hope, um, uh, will be there even when we use an advanced technology like chat GPT or artificial intelligence in the better administration of criminal justice. So, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, Professor Sukhuman sir. And uh, uh, on the way, I thank you, sir, and all the faculty members. And I thank uh, the, my colleague, Dr. Purvi, and uh, uh, Professor Gauro for uh, also facilitating as a co-organizers of this great <coughs> event to this uh, inaugural address opportunity. I hope that CMR also, like all other law schools, lead law schools, will come on to solid research project on one of the chosen areas in the Bangalore city, which is a fast growing city, which is one of the greatest destinations for investors and others, to uh, see that this society also is aware and it gears up itself for advances in criminal justice administration. Thank you, Anandal, and all the best for the whole day's proceedings.